Hi, I'm Wendell. You may remember me from such films as the construction of this computer using the MSI X299 SLI Plus. But this video is about the motherboard itself. This is the system that I had to build in order to review the motherboard. See how that works? So, so this is the MSI X299 SLI Plus. SLI Plus some other stuff. If you've been living under a rock, X299 is Intel's new chipset to go with their shiny new i5, i7, and i9 CPUs. For the first time ever, Intel's had i9 CPUs on socket 2066. 2066! Uh, that's a, it's an old Hope Star Runner thing. I can't, I can't help myself, I really can't. Right now, today, you can get four cores, four threads, four cores, eight threads, six cores, uh, 12 threads, eight cores, 16 threads, and 10 core, 20 thread. The 12 core CPU is just on the horizon. There are some samples out there, the clock speed, I don't know, it's all under a non-disclosure agreement, but there are also 14, 16, 18 core parts planned, rumor has it. So yeah, it's just gonna be two more cores than 16 cores. The problem is that this is Skylake X. It's a new micro architecture. It's even different than the old school Xeon architecture. So this motherboard is aimed at sort of the middle of the road X299. Now to be sure, X299 is an expensive platform. It is a very expensive platform with a very expensive CPUs. Intel to kind of mitigate that, you've got the KB Lake i5 and i7. I don't like those CPUs. They're not a good value. You, you can get the same exact, the exact same CPUs on a Z270 socket. Intel has literally glued the Z270 CPUs for socket 1151 onto socket 2066. It doesn't make any sense. Those CPUs were not designed for that. Those CPUs have integrated graphics. These motherboards have no way to take advantage of integrated graphics. You can't even use uh, the hardware video encoder stuff that you might be able to use even though there's no physical connectors for the graphics card on this motherboard. It's, a, it's just, that's an Intel thing. That's not an MSI thing, but you need full disclosure if you're gonna buy these kind of products. I think it's important to understand that. And so I'm probably gonna have to go into that on every single motherboard review, which means that every single X299 motherboard review is going to be insanely long. No one's going to share it and no one cares. Let's take a look at the rear I.O. panel before we tear into the motherboard. At the back of the motherboard, you've got the clear CMOS button and you've got the uh, USB BIOS flashback button. The USB BIOS flashback button will let you flash the UEFI even without a processor, which is important if you get a CPU uh, that is, you know, like the 12 core, or the 14 core, a CPU that's not out yet because this motherboard was available at X299 launch day and even Intel wasn't completely ready for X299 launch day. Buzzing. Next to that, you've got your PS2 mouse port and the USB 2.0 ports, one of which is for USB BIOS flashback. Then you've got two more USB 2.0 ports, and then you've got four USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, two of which are under one of your gigabit LANs. Now these are two Intel gigabit NICs. This is great, one built into the chipset and one that's an add-in PCI Express controller, I219V and I211AT. And then below your second LAN connector, you've got USB 3.1 uh, Gen 2, one type A and one reversible type C. And then next to that, you've got your audio ports. Now the audio implementation on this motherboard is designed for 120 dB signal to noise ratio. It's crystal sound with audio boost. That said, this is the SLI Plus. MSI offers motherboards with a more high-end audio solution on them, but it is on an isolated part of the PCB and it is designed for 120 dB signal to noise ratio. Uh, if you want a higher quality audio solution, you can get a USB DAC or an add-in sound card or something like that, but it does have optical SPDIF out, so you can take the optical out into something else and let something else digitize the sound. That works fine too. At the top of this motherboard, we've got a single eight pin power delivery socket. That means you can deliver up to 400 watts to this motherboard through that connector. Right next to the eight pin power connector, you've got a four pin fan header, that's SysFan3. Then you've got two more four pin fan headers on the other side where the dims are, and there's also a numeric diagnostic LED readout. Now that's a total of three four pin fan headers just at the top edge of the board. The motherboard does have eight DDR4 DIMM slots. This motherboard supports, you know, non error correcting DDR4 memory. So you can populate it in quad channel if you are using a quad channel CPU. Just below the 24 pin ATX power connector, we've got a 30 pin USB front panel connector. And they've got the USB 3.1 style front panel connector as well. This is a controller that supports 10 gigabit. So you can use 10 gigabit with this. And they've got another 
USB 3.0 front panel connector. Just below that, we've got six SATA 6 gigabit per second ports and a U.2 port, so you can use U.2 devices that are using, you know, 4X PCI Express lanes. Then just below that, we've got two more six gigabit per second SATA ports, and that takes us to the bottom edge of the motherboard. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel audio out, an RGB header. This is a four pin RGB LED strip header, so you can control LED strips with your motherboard if you want to. Then we've got three four pin fan headers. We've got a physical power and reset button. And then right next to that, we've got our front panel connector. Next to that are two USB 2.0 headers. You can use that with internal headers or uh, breakout cables or whatever you want. And then right next to that, we've got an, another connector. It says V-RAID. So this little four pin header is a header that will let you plug in a software key, a software unlock basically, to let you run M.2 RAID not through the PCH. This motherboard as it is has two M.2 slots built in, one below the PCI Express by 16 and one near the bottom of the board. Now the one near the bottom of the board that does not include the heat shield actually will have better airflow and better cooling. Generally, the other one is sort of blocked by your graphics card. In this particular motherboard, because both slots are PCI Express 3.0, there's no speed or performance penalty for using it in the bottom M.2 slot. So I'm gonna recommend that most people install their M.2 in the bottom M.2 slot. Now, one thing I didn't mention yet at the bottom of the motherboard is this little physical switch. What does this little physical switch do? Primary and backup BIOS, so primary and backup UEFI. So if something goes wrong when you're updating the UEFI in your machine, you can just flip that little switch and you'll be running on a backup. Now let's talk about the PCI Express slots. There are four by 16 physical slots. Two of those are armored and reinforced, so they're designed for heavier things like dual graphics cards, hence the name SLI+. The motherboard does come with a high-speed SLI bridge as well, which is a nice touch. The two plastic PCI Express by 16 slots are only by eight electrical. The motherboard also has two PCI Express 1 slots for peripherals and things like that. Those run through the PCH, so those don't really count against you in terms of your PCI Express connectivity. Now let's talk about the dirty little secret of X299. So the block diagram of the system, it's important to look at and understand this. The CPU, the X299 CPU connects to its chipset, the Intel chipset via DMI 3.0. That's basically a PCI Express 3.0 by four connection. However, the M.2 slots, there are two M.2 slots um, the, that are on the motherboard. Those are also connected through the PCH. Now, I haven't really seen any um, X299 motherboards yet that have M.2 that don't go through the PCH, but I would have liked to have seen at least one M.2 that does not go through the PCH. The reason for that is you've got your USB 3.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1, five gigabit, let's just say USB five gigabit. You've got your USB five gigabit devices that go through the PCH. You've got your slower devices that go through the PCH. And then you've got your higher speed peripherals like your M.2 that go through the PCH. There's only four gigabytes per second theoretical maximum bandwidth with that DMI 3.0 link. So if you're gonna get something like one of the new Samsung uh, high performance NVMe drives, or even the new Toshiba high performance NVMe drives, one drive almost by itself will saturate that DMI 3.0 link. To say nothing of, you know, it's like if you're copying things between two USB 5 gigabit devices and doing something with your NVMe, it's a bottleneck. The reason that I think Intel did that is so that they could maintain compatibility with the Kaby Lake CPUs, because if the DMI interface was different between Kaby Lake X and Skylake X, then I think that uh, Kaby Lake quote unquote X, uh, then I think that uh, the situation would be um, much more complicated in terms of supporting those four core CPUs. If you are buying X299, it is not a good value to buy the KB Lake CPU for this socket. You can get a better motherboard or a better graphics card with the, with the Delta in cash, the Delta in cash money uh, between saving on the motherboard. It makes no sense. It just, I don't know, the mind reels, the mind reels. The other thing to consider with the different CPUs is the available PCI Express lanes. And this is another reason I think that they went with the M.2s off the PCH, because if you're using a KB Lake CPU, you've only got 16 PCI Express lanes, the six and the eight core only have 28 lanes, and everything else is 44 lanes. And so motherboard manufacturers have to do this really Herculean juggling act to route those PCI Express lanes, because it's like, oh, can we count on this CPU having 44 PCI Express lanes? We'll just wire this socket directly into the CPU. Uh, no, it, it doesn't work that way. You can't even use half the memory slots if you use a KB Lake CPU. It's just, this is crazy. This is completely nuts. I need to put all this in a separate video that, that you can reference. Speaking of memory, it is DDR4 quad channel. It does support up to DDR4 4000. That is an overclock, you know, 2600 out of the box. 
um, is what you get, but you've got the XMP profile. I was testing it at DDR4 3600. The XMP profile in the UEFI was set and forget. It was, it was perfect. You will need to consult the manual to know which PCI Express slots uh, work depending on which CPU you're using. So keep that in mind. Now, of course, this being an MSI motherboard, it does come with RGB and RGB controls. I'm sort of happy to see that the RGB out of the box is, is pretty subdued. Um, you've got several RGB headers that you can use. It does come with the Mystic Light software that you can use for controlling your, your RGB. And uh, MSI and SteelSeries have been putting a lot of work into their software to be able to support features. I demoed some features at Computex, depending on which motherboard you have and, and all that sort of thing. I have not had a chance to get into that with this build yet but I have had a chance to test the IOMMU grouping. The IOMMU grouping out of the box is superb. Uh, it is basically exactly where it needs to be to be able to do whatever you wanna do. In this system, I set it up with two graphics cards and each graphics card was in its own configuration. I set it up with a, a, a Western Digital M.2, I set it up with a SATA drive, I set it up with a, an add-in USB controller that was a PCI Express by one through the PCH. Everything was basically how I expected it to be. There are a couple onboard peripherals like the sound card that are in a shared group, but the NICs are in separate groups, the, the add-in cards are in separate groups. It was, it was basically one of the best case scenarios that I've seen. I really was not expecting that with X299, but out of the box, it was, it was pretty good. And the only thing left is a tour of the UEFI. Let's do a tour of the UEFI. So this is the main screen that you get inside the MSI SLI Pro Plus X299. We can see here the motherboard, the installed CPU, BIOS revision, DDR voltage, V-Core. I have turned on XMP and rebooted, so there's that at least. We've got the main settings here, which is just, you know, system status. There's really not a lot out of the ordinary in here. It'll show you the status of the M.2 ports, the U.2 port, the SATA ports. But other than that, there's not really a lot of information in here. You can do the DMI information to look at the uh, information to do with the DMI, which is sort of low level system information. It doesn't include the memory DMI, that's somewhere else, but I'll show you that. You can configure the PCI Express link speed if auto is not working for you. Some devices like the Blackmagic uh, 4K Intensity Pro capture cards don't really like PCI Express 3.0 and you have to explicitly set PCI Express 2.0. At least the cards that I have require PCI Express 2.0, so your mileage may vary. Auto does not work with them. You can configure boot options and boot priority depending on what devices you have available to boot from. This is especially handy if you're doing a dual boot situation with like Linux or something. You can configure security, trusted computing, and chassis intrusion detection if your chassis has a chassis intrusion switch. And then everything really interesting is under the OC settings. Now, as with everything, I definitely recommend that you update the UEFI before you do anything when you're building a system. But once you've got that stabilized and once you're satisfied that your CPU temperature is not unreasonable at default speeds, uh, you can start to mess with the overclock. You can come in here and set the CPU ratio. On our 10 core CPU, I was able to achieve an uh, overclock multiplier of 42 while upping the voltage to only 1.1 volts from 0.983 volts. So you just key in 1.1, 1.1 for the ring voltage as well. And we were basically off to the races. Those are the only settings that we needed to change. Of course, there are a lot of other options in here, system agent settings, IO settings, phase lock loop trim offset settings. Uh, you know, your DRAM channel A and B, which is going to be 1.2 volts by default, but 1.35, 1.36 volts when you do the uh, XMP. The PCH voltage, which is the chipset voltage, uh, and there's also a memory triad feature. So if you're looking to overclock your memory, you're looking to tighten your memory timings, you can try a set of settings, and if it doesn't work, if it fails, it'll just, you know, reset back to default so that you don't lose all of your other settings in UEFI and have to do a full reset. If you do get it over your head, there is a button on the back I.O. panel that you can use to reset the BIOS, so you know, keep that in mind, that's handy. Here we can see the CPU technology support, so you can just verify if you're gonna do you know, virtualization or something like that, it works. Now do note that the VTD necessary for hardware pass-through, PCI Express pass-through, IOMMU, the, those types of videos that you see on the Linux channel, those are disabled by default. Those extensions are disabled by default. So even though you see them, you're gonna have to come in here and you're gonna have to go down to you know, Intel VTD technology and enable that because it is disabled by default. Uh, depending on how you're doing on your overclocking, you may also want to disable the C-State technology. I'm not really sure, I haven't experimented with this too much, but I noticed that when you do the uh, overclock presets using the OC Genie, that by and large it disables the, uh, the Intel C-State stuff. Normally I like to keep that on because when you're not using your CPU, it'll downclock, but 
uh, X299 seems to be a little bit of a different critter there. And here's where you can read your memory uh, specifications directly from the EEPROM on the memory. So you can see, you know, we're using our G-Skill Trident Z memory, and these are the timings, and the XMP support information is in here. Now, there is an EZ mode, and from the EZ mode, you can do fan info and actually set and configure your fan options and your fan profile. If you are using that hardware RAID key, the VROC key that I mentioned before, that will also show up here so that you can, you can do some you know, PCI Express RAID through your uh, RAID storage controller stuff that that turns on. This is the uh, fan hardware monitor. You can configure the fan profiles and configure, you know, is this a DC fan or a PWM fan and the temperature zones that it responds to in terms of fan control. So you can monitor your system voltage down here, your fan speeds, temperature source, step up time, step down time, so that you don't hear the uh, fan ramping noises if those kinds of things are annoying to you. And you can also see which fans are installed. So you can see that we've got our CPU fan one. Now this is our water pump. So this shows us that our water pump is running at uh, 1400 uh, RPM. Then I've got a fan plugged into the pump one header, which is also around 1100 RPM. I've got one more fan on the system one header that helps with the VRM cooling and we can see the uh, the RPMs there. And that's pretty much it for the full tour of the UEFI on this motherboard. Now I'm still tweaking with the overclocks here and the final performance. Um, overall, the VRM performance was not as bad as I expected. Some of the you know stuff on the internet you read is like all doom and gloom and everything's on fire and you know Intel house fires. Boy, that shoe's on the other foot with that. But uh, we've got the single eight pin power connector for the CPU. Uh, which if you're gonna do an extreme overclock is not great, but this motherboard is not meant for extreme overclocking And let me tell you I got I got a retail i9 4.6 on all cores Unless you like de-lid and do crazy stuff. That's about all you're gonna get I pushed this thing to 250 watts give or take. I mean, I'm still tweaking it This may change in the future, but I pushed this thing to 250 watts through this CPU with this all-in-one cooler from Corsair it was 4.6 at 1.15 volts, 1.84 volts final input at maximum. Um, and about 4.6 was all I could get. Now, if I'm only gonna do like four cores, I could get like 4.9, which tells me that it's probably a thermal or power delivery problem. But I don't think it's a motherboard power delivery problem. I think it's a power delivery problem inside the CPU. Um, maybe a different power delivery system on the motherboard would help with that. But if you're going for an extreme overclock, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell you. i9 is really not ideal for an extreme overclock. I was able to get my hands on a KB Lake i5 to test because I'm a glutton for punishment, just to confirm that it's like, this doesn't seem like this would be a good idea. Nope, not a good idea, confirmed. But overall, for this motherboard, for the price point, it's not bad. It's an SLI Plus, it's kind of middle of the road, X299, X299 being a kind of expensive platform. If you're gonna build an eight or a 10 core CPU, it's not a bad choice, because you've got the dual Intel NICs and it's got a pretty decent feature set, and the overclockability, it's not bad. So if you're thinking about picking up one of these, or you did pick up one of these, let us know in the forums at Level One Tech. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there. Let's take a look at what's in the box. Well, we've got the motherboard. That's a pleasant surprise. Got our driver and installation CD. This is our nice high-speed SLI bridge. This will be great for using the SLI feature of the SLI Plus motherboard. We've got two SATA six gigabit per second cables, our ATX IO cover, registration and warranty card, our CPU installation guide. Here's a memory installation notice, which I will talk more about. Then our installation manual. Ooh, X299. I'm detecting that installation manuals are a little thicker than they used to be. Wonder what that's about. Oh yeah, the X299 platform is overly complicated for no reason. I totally knew that. Thanks, Intel.